Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group, where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill, and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. No two successions look alike. Every succession looks looks different than the one before it, but also it, I think in a lot of ways, it's a reaction to the one before it. So the succession that we had looked very different than the the, the, the animosity and the sort of impersonalness that my, my father had with his father. And so when we talk about succession, the thing that I always say is, you know, you have your incumbent generation and your succeeding generation. There are literally an infinite, infinite number of ways the succeeding generation can succeed the incumbent generation. But that infinite number of ways, the only one I can say with certainty that will not work is one that the incumbent generation designs for the succeeding generation. That succeeding generation has to not just participate, but has to drive what that succession process looks like. I said to my dad, hey, I'll come back, help you as much as you want. It's a hundred bucks an hour. So tell me when you want me and I'll show up. So I did that for six months or so, and I helped him with a lot of things. I helped him clean up his books. Um, and here's some of the things I found out. I found out that during the time I was gone, my brother brought in zero customers. Wow. Business went from 6.8 million back to under 2 million. And my dad was losing like $10,000. And that's when he called me. <laughs> Gee, you could have called me a little sooner, dad. So I came back and eventually, you know, he, he would tell me he can't afford me and this and that and the other. And I said, well, then just let me buy the company. I'll, I'll, I'll be friendly with you. I'll go on payroll. You got to sell me the company. We came back to half the team, the same profitability. So that was a big learning for me that I was, you know, I was just over expanding on revenue and I was not really open. So, uh, so now we have 15% people working from anywhere in the world. We can have somebody in China or London who can write a better script or better English or better Spanish or do a better design. Why not? I think it was stupid to think that anybody should ever... I want to have the best agency in the world. But for that, you have to come to my office in Delhi or Vancouver and work in that specific location. And the best talent would say you come to me. So 15% of those people we, you know, we get from everywhere. But at the same time, we realize people just do not work when they're not in that ecosystem. Yeah. So we had to qualify 5% people back to the office. Now we're back full force. We, we're not still back to the same pre-COVID numbers in terms of revenue, but we're back to the same profitable. I wrote this book, it's called The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, so that others could learn from people like you and people like me. I've hosted hundreds of parties and I've learned and I've written down all my lessons. But here's the idea. Here's what I want to challenge you to, if, if you two would be open to it. I think you can get a ton of benefits by hosting a cocktail party that has some constraints and some rules. What do I mean by that? I mean, everybody has name tags for one. Two, it's only two hours long. Three, it's held on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night. And four, you're gonna do rounds of icebreakers with people just to mix up the conversational groups. And so I wrote this book and I've trained and helped hundreds of people now host their first cocktail party. Because I think that when you own a family business, when you're in a family business, if you're a business owner, it can be really lonely. One lesson learned is, you know, communicate early and often, right? And and the communication, you know, you've got to put, you've almost got to put procedures in place to ensure that that communication happens, you know? And the more disparate some you are, as you mentioned, like geographic and that, the more you have to kind of do that. And some of that, you know, so some of that people call it governance, 
um, yeah. or structures around that. But there just needs to be kind of really clear. Um, you know what it is? It's really boundaries. Mm -hmm. And just like in a family where you need some boundaries in business, especially in a family business, you need those boundaries and those boundaries, uh, you know, can help or hurt your communication. But communicating and and getting aligned on goals is absolutely key um, for any business, but especially for a family business, you know. It took me a long time to get to the six locations we're at now mm -hmm. uh, for the first seven or eight years. I only had two to three locations. Mm -hmm. And for a chunk of that, I was kind of wearing all these different hats. After seven or eight or nine years, I started to realize, okay, I need to create a very clear plan, a clear vision of what the organization needs to look like and figure out where we want to go. Um, now today, it's not as difficult. Every site, we have a site manager, an assistant manager. We know our core values that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have a, an area manager that oversees all six locations. That would have been you back in the day. That would have been me. I, I wore all the hats, all it, you know, from the area manager all the way down to the CSA. Right. Right. It was a great exposure uh, for me. Certainly uh, grabbed hold of uh, you know how passionate we are about uh, the beverage itself. Uh, you know, it, it was an uh, opportunity and, and uh, a wonderful opportunity to learn how to drink coffee black. <laughs> where you can truly taste the coffee. Uh, and so I remember that vividly. Uh, but it was important uh, for me as uh, a leader in the third generation uh, of the family to really immerse myself into the business in all aspects of the business. That was something that both my father and my uncle did when they were younger. Uh, and so uh, they really held that as a strong value that if our business was going to be successful over uh, multiple generations, that each generation member uh, who wanted to work in the business needed to have exposure uh, through all aspects of it. I'd say at the core, it's trust. And that's what makes, you know, we're not so, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but so, um, full of ourselves to think that every person who's doing their job is the best person that could possibly be doing that job mm -hmm. and happens to be family. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is we have that trust. You know, I don't, my brother's not going to leave and go do something else. We're here, we're in this together, we're going right. to fight it out. And I think that's the, that's the bit of it that you can really lean on, um, you know, on the flip side of it you're taking a lot of trust when you bring in family because it's not exactly easy to, it's going to be awkward at Thanksgiving if you, you know, fire yeah. your nephew or, you know, yeah. so, yeah. Um, so there's, it goes both ways, but um, there is that, that trust element that you find with family that's, that's hard to reproduce um, just with kind of cold hiring, I guess. I think communication, the, the best, the best way for us is, you know, as, as three brothers that are, that are running, you know, the, the, the company, um, communication is key. It doesn't work out all the time, but I think when you have the right understanding and the ability to stop for a minute and reflect on your own actions or your own thoughts and how you can apply them to a situation to make sure, I wouldn't say that everyone is happy with everything, but that they understand that the, the, the goal, the end game is in alignment with each other. So, you know, sometimes you might not think it's the best decision or one person might not, but ultimately it still moves forward because there's 100% there's trust there that everything we do on a daily basis is to drive things forward. So yeah, communication is definitely one. Um, empathy would be another. The ability to understand each other's perspective and, and, and how it makes us you know, feel. I quickly did a 180 and I came back to the strategy of simplifying everything within our business from the products to the processes to making sure that uh, we have assembly lines, so to speak, in-house for everybody that is, is touching these deliverables is an expert in one or two functions that they're responsible for. So that just elevated their happiness, elevated work quality, expedited turnaround times, and the end result, happier clients. Uh, we just immediately saw our net promoter score climb up. Uh, you know, knock on wood, we're at, we, we've increased it every single year. We're at an 88 and I keep thinking, wow, we're not going to see it climb any further and, and somehow it does. But um, I think a lot of that can be attributed to a heavy focus on simplifying our business. It wasn't about my individual cont contribution to the team. It was about how we help each other. And I think that 
finding those niches, right? Like what, who are the right people? What, what do they bring to the table and how do we motivate and bring them up versus, you know, letting them flail because realistically everybody has something of value to bring. And some of my best, my best employees and, uh, students who I found like totally changed their lives. Same thing. It was like, once we found that thing that really brought their motivation to the higher level, they all of a sudden were like, Oh wait, I can do this, you know? And, and that's just so exciting to see somebody really thrive. People first, positive mindset, positivity, leadership. Uh, these are all have essentially become buzzwords at this point. Uh, a lot of people want to embrace the concepts and a lot of people don't fully understand the concepts. Uh, my goal is to bridge that, bridge that gap, make sure that we are actually embracing being people first, truly putting our people ahead. Uh, our organization is nothing without the people that drive it. Uh, I'm one person sitting here. We are truly led from within uh, rather than the top. So we need to help the breed and build the leaders within. And part of that is the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and financial well-being. All five of those key characteristics are really important to living a good life and staying motivated for both your home and work life. Uh, I've experienced that personally, and that's what gave me the drive to spread that to more people. And what better avenue to do it than my own business? And I was waiting for a table the other day at a really busy restaurant. And this gentleman, I was having a conversation with this gentleman and, and he ended up running a big business in the Silicon Valley. And you know, funny, actually, Chris, he saved John Maxwell. He was a big John Maxwell fan. And we started talking about business and he just started telling me about his journey and his career. And it's like from that 10 minute conversation before my name got called to go to my table, I learned so much, probably more than I could ever learn from a book. So you just, you just never know what interaction is gonna give you some, some great takeaways. So my thing is just always be open, be open-minded, extremely open-minded, and, and try, to, try to learn from everyone around you. There's sometimes that false bravado yeah. that children have, and they think they can do it. And it, I always say like the best leader is someone who's really humble. Mm -hmm. So when a parent is humble, they don't need to yeah. own the fact, you know, they don't have to have ownership, power, or control any longer. Right. Um, but they can't release it until they know also that their child is humble um, yeah. because arrogance kills too many deals. 100%. And I mean, if I think about and where I think it is great, I mean, I remember my very first manager job at Home Depot. I applied for the manager. I wanted that role and cherish. Chase, God bless her, my, the best manager I ever had. I got turned down and she was like, you are not ready for this job wow. and you don't have the experience. And gosh yeah. darn it, I cried and was so sad. But you know what taught me the best thing is to go back. Like we don't just have to hand it to them. And I would have flopped in that job. And I learned so much about what I needed to do. So I think having some tough love is not a bad thing. So there's the need to have that mindset, that strategic mindset as a family. We need to be cultivating new businesses. We need to be expanding the borders of our business, whether it's through new products, new services, um, new geographies, new investments, new JVs and what have you. But beyond like the business side of things, you touched on a really important point, which is the complexity of a family over time. As families, over time, you have new entrants, you have exits, unfortunately, you might have divorces. Over here, we have polygamy. Polygamy mm. is very common. Mm. So all these complexities of the changing family necessitate that governance is absolutely critical. We're starting, and we're starting with kids, I mean, fairs for kids, little kids kids coming in to learn about the trades on um, vocational schools. Um, roofing is getting involved in with um, Let's Build with Women, with Habitat for Humanity, um, all of these different programs that are talking about roofing. So it's a real long-term strategy because it's going to take some time. We're in now roofing is now you would think we'd already have been in construction management schools. But that mm -hmm. just happened in the last five to ten years. Wow. So we're catching up to the engineers and the electricians and everybody else. Um, and so that's really long-term strategy, but short-term strategy is about the community, getting to understand and know your community better. So like in those rural areas, it's mm -hmm. fun because we talk about FFA and 4-H. Mm -hmm. We talk about high school shop class. Mm -hmm. we talk about how to get in there and get them to be 
you know, sponsoring baseball teams so that they know who this roofing company is. Learn the business cold because people are going to be watching you as you enter your family business. They want to know how the, that next generation is going to carry themselves. Are they going to shoot their mouths off or are they going to be a student of the business? And so that, that, that person I spoke with said, learn the business cold so when you speak up, you are right. Yes, and, and no the, entitlement and then, zone here. Well, and, and, and related to entitlement was the third, the third sort of key point, the theme that was underscored to me was be really cognizant of how you carry yourself when you enter that business, when you enter the business, how you comport yourself and act with humility. And I try to be someone who acts with humility, but look, we're, we, David and I have been very fortunate in our lives. We've gotten incredible opportunities. And as you said, privilege and how, how do you go into the organization and you try to act with humility, look people in the eye, treat them with respect. What is our big audacious goal? Our big audacious goal is to build generational wealth in underbanked communities mm -hmm. by offering affordable capital to Latinx entrepreneurs. That, right. is, that is our mission. Um, notice I didn't lead with deploying capital, affordable capital into the market. No, it's really building generational wealth. At the end of the day, we see entrepreneurs as vessels to uh, to build generational wealth. Because if you make an entrepreneur successful, they are gonna hire more people, they're gonna elevate their employees, that entrepreneur is gonna, are natural leaders within their communities, right? And they're gonna elevate the community in the process and, and they're gonna put money in their, in their account. And we want that too. It's very important that the entrepreneurs that we're supporting make money. So we had some things in writing. We started talking about continuity planning and things we needed to do. Uh, it wasn't until people keep asking me, so how much longer are you going to have? And I, well, I say 10 years. Well, five years into that, and I'm still saying 10 years. I of course. Or if somebody does the math, I'm in trouble. So we hired a group, a consulting group, to come in and really help us do that. And, and what I found out of it was, A, they were much more able to put a clear concise, hey, here's what you really have to get accomplished, plan together, and here's the, here's the metrics you probably do to use for that. And I discovered also that while I thought I had a pretty good open relationship with that whole group, and I, I do, that this allowed them to have conversations with somebody and maybe dive a little deeper into things that they would be uncomfortable bringing up with just me. And, and they could help facilitate those conversations. One of the things about construction that's, that's interesting is that it typically lags a little bit behind. When an economy starts falling, construction lags a little bit behind that because you're still fin finalizing projects and that kind of yep. thing. Yep. Um, so we really didn't start noticing the crunch of you know, pandemic effects until about September or October. And yeah, and then we, we started realizing that that projects that we would have been up against three other Masons uh, a year and a half ago, all of a sudden we're finding like 15 to 20 other Masons are bidding on the same work with, that we're bidding on. So we've really had to focus this year on reducing our overhead costs mm -hmm. and um, and also increasing our value propositions for, for our general contractor partners and how we can uh, stand out to them and, and help them more than our competitors might be able to. Don't try to do it by yourself because I took over and I answer to no one. I don't have to answer to anybody. It's my company. I can do whatever I want. So I can make dumb decisions. I can make smart decisions. The smart decisions are to get involved with groups of people that you have to bounce these things off of. Because I went out and I made some dumb decisions. I did some dumb things. But then I started talking with people that were doing the right things and learning from them and bouncing these ideas off of them and getting directed. So now that I'm accountable to some people, I have to answer to some people and it changed my business. It changed the way we did things. And all of a sudden now our profit margins are going way up. We're doing the right things. We're, we're, we're not doing this Right. on every year to year on, on our profits. We are now working in such a way that we had a, a blip yesterday that happened that I had to jump on the management call with them. And I had to express to them a concept that we have learned from the Navy SEALs, which is commander's intent, right? So my, my sole job now is to tell people, this is how I want the battlefield to look after we leave it. That's right. it. 
Right. It is their job to do that. It doesn't matter how good the plan is. Once the bullets start flying, mm -hmm. everybody's out for themselves. But we now go through that sort of uh, activity on a frequent basis. And then it frees me up uh, from the minutia and from a lot of things that I don't add value to when I touch. It frees me up from those so that I can only focus on the things that we do add value to. So I'm out there renegotiating a lot of our carrier contracts, a lot of our compensation, redoing a lot of the uh, recruiting intake and, you know, those things that no one really has time to dedicate and get really right. I think when you're less profitable, it, it definitely brings up stress that creates a lot of challenges and tension. I think too, if you haven't worked on any sort of the interpersonal dynamics within the family, that working together tends to bring that stuff out. So, and, and so yes, I think you could tie that back to the profitability because right. when you're working together and if things are stressful, then it, it's going to put a strain on that relationship and it's going to bring, it's going to enunciate, I guess, some of the, maybe the underlying issues or the, the inabilities to maybe communicate or face each other. It definitely brought us all to another level of honesty and need for clarity and need for trust and, and real understanding that I don't think I was really anticipating. What keeps trafficking going? It's a $150 billion a year industry. Wow. And the reason people do it is because the profits are obscene. If you're in New York and you have four girls in your stable, you're probably bringing in a million dollars a year and that's tax free. My gosh. So you're doing it. I mean, it's incredible suffering, but your odds of doing jail time are less than one in a hundred. And by the way, that's global. In, in the world, if you're trafficking, you probably aren't going to do jail. There, there's no deterrent for it. There's, you know, wow. in general, there's no deterrent and they're obscene profits. And it does exist in our country today. On a phenomenal just scale. I mean, not, just a, not, not just something that exists in other countries. You're saying like that's a real situation happening in New York. New York, by some standards, is the sex trafficking capital of the world. This podcast is sponsored by myself, Jonathan Goldhill, and my company, The Goldhill Group where we provide coaching for growing companies. I'm Jonathan Goldhill and my purpose is simple, to guide entrepreneurial leaders in family businesses towards more freedom and fulfillment. I want entrepreneurs to get clarity around the changes that will make them and their businesses more successful so they can experience the same freedom I've enjoyed in my life. Our proven practices challenge business owners to think differently about their business and how they're running it and quite literally become game changers in our clients' companies. Learn more at the goldhillgroup.com website where you can schedule your free strategy session. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to DisruptiveSuccessor.com.